Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brekna and I work for the Left Book Club. This is one of our first online discussions, so please do bear with us if there are any technical difficulties, we're just getting used to this ourselves. Um, the meeting will last for about an hour. I will say a few words in the beginning, um, just to give people a chance to join the call if they are running late. Um, before we begin our discussion with Christina. If you'd like to contribute to the discussion or ask questions, please do so in the chat. The LBC is a space for respectful debate and discussion, so please do the, bear this in mind when contributing. This event will be recorded and clips of it might be used on social media. So, just to give you an introduction to the Left Book Club, um, we are a subscription book club and not-for-profit initiative um, and we want to encourage engagement with books like the Black Jacobins. The original LBC existed in the 1930s and 40s when the world was going through a very different sort of crisis and it presented radical ideas for social change. Um, we have sought to revive the spirit of collective political education. We think that conversations around politics, economics and society are too important to remain within the academy and that all of us should be engaging with the ideas that impact our lives. So today we face a global crisis and in this time of unprecedented um, uncertainties and hardship, we wanted to build a sense of solidarity within our community and to learn from each other as we strive to create better alternatives. This event is part of Radical May, a month long um, online book fair put together by the newly created Radical Publishers Alliance. And I'll share a link for the rest of the events in the chat. Um, so the book we are discussing today is The Black Jacobins, CLR James's masterful work. And we're so thankful to Dr. Christina Fryer for joining us for this conversation. Christina teaches Black British history at Goldsmiths University of London and is a historian of modern Britain, the British Empire and the modern Caribbean. Her work focuses on Britain's centuries-long imperial and especially post-emancipation entanglements with the Caribbean. So, um, I'll just leave this here. Christina, I wondered if you could begin by telling us when you first read The Black Jacobins um, and what your initial reaction was after reading the book. So, uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity um, to uh, to speak uh, today and to uh, engage in this conversation um, about a book that I think is uh, incredibly uh, incredibly important, and that is the Black Jacobins. Um, so, earlier today, I actually pulled down my old uh, copy. It's not it's not that old, but uh, it's one of the more uh, used in my collection. Um, so this is the uh, 19, this is the revised edition of the 1960, uh, 63, 62 version of uh, the Black Jacobins. Um, and I first, I actually came to this relatively late, at least for a Caribbeanist. Um, so I work on um, Jamaica in particular um, and uh, had in graduate school done a lot of work on um, post-emancipation Jamaica and its connections to uh, the British Empire uh, and had always had in my head that I needed to read uh, the Black Jacobins but just had not gotten around to it. Um, so it was actually the it was actually when I started uh, teaching the Modern Caribbean Survey um, which I taught uh, my version of for the first time in um, 2000 11 or 2012, um, I assigned it um, for that for that survey's uh, discussion of the Haitian Revolution 
um, and has up until very recently been the the text that I use to teach uh, to teach the Haitian Revolution uh, in Caribbean surveys and in other in other courses. Um, so that was a context in which I read it. Um, I had heard uh, really amazing things uh, about it. Um, there are a lot of people, I'm not one of them, but there are a lot of people who uh, sort of open it and then uh, they next get up when they finish it. Um, so it is an incredibly engrossing, uh, engrossing narrative. Um, and my take on it was, A, that I was glad that I had assigned it. Um, I think it's a text that it's important, uh, I think particularly for undergraduates, it's, it's an incredibly important text. Um, it is, it's a text written by a very prominent and very important uh, Black intellectual, uh, and so for teaching purposes, that, that was really, that has always been very important to me to be teaching as many uh, Black scholars uh, and Black writers as possible. Uh, and particularly, I think in this case, uh, James isn't an academic per se in the classic way that a lot of students encounter academics in the classroom, um, so I think for me it was also important to flag that this was an important intellectual um, and uh, an important Pan-Africanist uh, uh, intellectual. Um, I think, you know, there's some discussions and some debates, I think, within, um, within Caribbeanists uh, who, teach, uh, who teach this text or who teach the Haitian Revolution um, about whether we should be teaching or whether, whether, yeah, whether to assign Black Jacobins versus some other newer texts. So there are some updates um, since, the, since he wrote the book. There's, uh, there are more documents available. Uh, different kinds of analysis are now possible uh, that weren't possible uh, at the time. Um, and so there are some, some updates, particularly I think around Toussaint Louverture. Um, but for me, I think, I, you know, I'm not a, a specialist of, of Haiti. Um, or even necessarily a specialist of Haitian Revolution. Uh, and for me, I think this book still remains the most important one to teach. Um, its importance, the narrative that it, that it provides, the way it really captures um, the, the drama of the, the Haitian Revolution, um, the way it captures uh, contingency, which is a concept that uh, I really like to emphasize in, um, in, in my teaching, the idea that from 1791, uh, uh, if you look just at 1791, there was certainly no guarantee that the Haitian Revolution was going to be the Haitian Revolution as we know it. Um, and there were a lot of points along the way um, at which the, the you know, permanent breaking away of, uh, of Haiti from France might not have happened. Um, and he, and uh, James really captures that in, in the narrative. Um, so it's a text that I enjoy rereading every time I assign it. I actually haven't assigned it in the past few years since I moved to the UK. I uh, do not have time in my teaching schedule uh, or in the, in, the, in, the, in the syllabus to, to assign uh, the Black Jacobins, and I really miss, uh, really miss teaching it. So um, I'm glad to have the new copy uh, as an excuse uh, to read it again. Thanks, Christina. That's great. Um, could you tell us about the importance of this book in terms of its impact on other anti-colonial uh, studies and works on the sort of anti-colonial canon? Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, the Black, ja the Black Jacobins is interesting because it was, you know, first written or first published in 1938. Um, and then I think to some degree was, um, was ignored by certainly some of the uh, scholarship of um, sort of imperial Europe, um, which um, a lot of that scholarship in the 1930s and 1940s uh, was uh, very much focused on um, still praising in particular the British Empire and to some degree uh, the, the French Empire. There were a lot of uh, ideas still floating around in that scholarship about um, the, the need for the colonies to remain dependent on uh, European metropoles. Uh, as we move into the 1960s, which is when he uh, republished the second edition, um, which is the edition that, I've, that I uh, have taught from and I think a lot of people teach from, um, that, you know, he's publishing that in, the, in a moment of significant uh, independence and decolonization movements across uh, the Caribbean and across, um, and across Africa. Um, so the moment has changed uh, quite, uh, has changed quite tremendously. Um, one of the impacts that I think um, James does not get enough credit for, at least among, um, among historians, um, is 
there's a kind of scholarship that became very popular, I think, in the late 90s and early 2000s um, that was known as Atlantic history and, and still known as, as Atlantic history. Um, and this is a form of history that is, is thinking about um, the societies that roughly surround the Atlantic Ocean um, and the connections between them roughly between 1492 and let's just say 1850. Um, and this is a very, uh, it, it was, uh, I think it's, it's past its heyday a little bit, um, but it's still a very important uh, form of, of historiography and, of, and a field in, in the discipline of history. Um, and James really was doing this uh, in the 1930s, first of all, and then again in, in the 1960s. So he was really ahead of the field uh, of the, he, 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 he's he was incredibly ahead of scholarly trends. Um, I think he was ahead in terms of writing about us being um, sort of their own fate. Um, and you see some of this literature starting to, you see similar types of things starting to emerge um, in African American history at this time. Uh, but certainly very little of this was happening in European history in the 1930s or again in the 1960s. Um, so you do start to see some significant, uh, he, he does, uh, he does um, predate a lot of really significant trends in, in the field, uh, which again is why I think the work is, is so important to read even, uh, even after all of this time. One thing that definitely comes across um, really powerfully in the book and that James kind of comments on um, is that he felt quite tired that slaves were represented as these passive victims of history and he really wanted to overturn that idea and present them as the protagonists of this epic revolution. Um, I wondered if you could speak to the importance of that for a bit. Yeah, this is an incredibly important move and I'll actually say that I don't know that uh, James necessarily succeeded um, in, in doing that beyond a, a, a certain key figure. So there's some discussion among, uh, among scholars about the extent to which he actually succeeded in foregrounding um, the, the sort of enslaved masses or formerly enslaved masses, as opposed to, I think the second half of the book really turns into kind of a character study of Toussaint Louverture um, and, and a few other uh, uh, leaders of the, of the revolution, including, uh, of course, Dessalines. Um, there is some new research coming out uh, that I think is very interesting that talks about that actually James himself realized this. Um, and was sort of constantly thinking about how to revise or redo or rework these ideas um, of how to, in fact, really properly foreground um, enslaved enslaved people who weren't necessarily leaders of the the, the leaders of at first the slave rebellion and then the uh, and then the revolution. Um, so there are um, there is there's a woman who was recently published about. Um, uh, who's recently published about some of the work and some of the uh, dramatic work um, that he uh, that he has done, um, and she has noted um, that he uh, worked that some of the plays that he was working on in the 1960s uh, were in fact a way of uh, of sort of thinking again or revisiting this material and trying to continue to foreground uh, in, in enslaved people. Um, the reason this is so important, though, is um, again, when you think about the state of the literature in the 1930s, um, particularly a lot of the literature coming out of uh, the United States and about um, enslaved people in, in the U.S., uh, a lot of that literature was really, um, uh, was really still drawing on some Confederate ideas of, uh, and, and sort of antebellum ideas about um, enslaved people's uh, intellectual capacity, their ability to organize, um, their ability to strategize uh, politically and militarily. Um, and so the emphasis, even just on Toussaint Louverture, whether or not uh, James was as successful as he might have wanted um, in, in focusing specifically on enslaved people, um, even the focus on Louverture, excuse me, <clears throat> that focus itself was, was revolutionary. Uh, at the time, to talk about a black leader um, as a towering intellectual figure 
uh, and a strategic mastermind in the 1930s and then again in the 1960s um, was tremendously significant in the historical in the historical profession. Um, talking about the Haitian Revolution as on par with the French Revolution and the American Revolution, uh, again, is, is not what the state of the scholarship was um, at that moment. And in fact, I think still, certainly in, in popular imagination, we don't necessarily think about the Haitian Revolution as on par with the American Revolution. Uh, certainly that's not how I was taught the American Revolution in, when I was growing up in the U.S. as something that was part of a set of revolutions that included the Haitian Revolution. Um, so I think just even the focus on Louverture itself at that moment uh, was, was incredibly, incredibly important. Great. Um, just a reminder to our audience, um, please do feel free to send in questions um, or points of reflection in the chat. I'll pick up on these as the discussion progresses. Um, so, Christina, you mentioned earlier on that um, this book was written in 1938 in a very specific historical moment. Um, and in James's own words, this was in the context of the booming of Franco's heavy artillery, the rattle of Stalin's firing squads, and the fierce, shrill revolutionary movement stirring for clarity and influence. How did this combination of historical factors shape the Black Jacobins, shape the work? Well, I think um, a few things actually. And, um, I would add to this uh, also the the situation in the Caribbean uh, at uh, at the time. So the 1930s uh, is a moment in in Caribbean history, and of course, um, so uh, C. L. R. James was Trinidadian um, and uh, was moving back and forth, or was moving um, around between Trinidad, um, London, and the United States uh, in between the, the 1930s and, and 1960s. Um, so. Part of what's happening in the Caribbean in the 1930s, and especially in 1938, is a is a um, is the growth of a significant labor movement um, that is pushing back against some of the um, colonial uh, oppressions and degradations that that were really continuing on um, in the in the 1930s. Um, and in fact, in, in the late 1930s, 1937, 1938, there are a series of labor riots and labor and labor strikes uh, that, this, that the publication of the first book or the first edition um, are, are, are coinciding, are co coinciding with. Um, so I think that is, for me, I, I always want to, to include or think about also what is going on in, in the Caribbean. Um, but yes, I think you get the very clear sense in the way that um, in the way that James writes that he is not just writing about the Haitian Revolution for its own sake, although its own sake is is uh, is enough in in a lot of ways. Um, but that he is thinking about the possibilities of revolution in the twentieth century, um, and so uh, as we know, um, or as, as I think many people might know. Um, James was uh, James was Marxist, uh, and so had great uh, great had, a, had great affinity for uh, many of those ideas, and was imagining uh, perhaps um, some kind of uh, Marxist revolution. Um, but especially, you see this in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties uh, uh, edition. He's also thinking very much about um, uh, he's thinking very much about the possibilities of African independence. Um, so by the time the second uh, the second edition is published, uh, Trinidad uh, was independent and Jamaica uh, was independent. Um, the rest of the the British Caribbean was not. Um, but he is he writes pretty explicitly, I believe, in the in the introduction to that volume that he is also thinking about the possibilities of independence uh, and perhaps even revolutionary independence uh, in in Africa as well. So this really is a um, it is, a, it is about the Caribbean, and it is written by a man who is from the Caribbean, and unabashedly so, um, but it is really oriented uh, to, to a broad uh, global audience, that the Haitian Revolution might in fact inspire, um, might inspire broader revolutions either in Europe or then in later edition in Africa as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a few questions coming through now. Um, 
Dave says, uh, Dave's asking about the influence of the Haitian Revolution around the world, um, and if you could speak about that influence. I mean, James, on multiple occasions on the book, he uh, references how much the French Revolution and the Haitian Revolution were intertwined, um, and that this story is not just the story of Haiti, but also the story um, of France. So I wonder if you could speak about those global dimensions. Yeah. Um, so when I when I teach the Asian Revolution, part of what I I suggest to students is that um, is that first of all that the Haitian Revolution I describe it as a sort of Enlightenment revolution uh, on par with the American Revolution and the French Revolution, uh, and then in particular I think the Haitian Revolution asked and answered a question that the first two revolutions were not especially interested in, um, which is whether the men in and you know the, the language was around men um but whether the men included in um all of these liberties that the american and french revolution uh were talking about whether that extended to uh black people as well um and for the haitian revolution it did uh and and very and very dramatically so um one of the things that james makes clear uh in the narrative um is that uh, Toussaint Louverture in particular was not that interested for a long stretch of time, was not that interested in breaking away from France, uh, and that the breakaway, uh, the breakaway from, uh, from France um, happened at a moment when it seemed as though France was going to try to reimpose uh, slavery back onto, uh, onto Haiti, which it successfully did um, in some of the other uh, French uh, Caribbean islands. Um, so paramount to Louverture at least, was emancipation from slavery and maintaining that and then when that uh, seemed to be threatened then this sort of final phase of the revolution uh, emerges so uh I, so again i, I think that the haitian Re that that's part of how the haitian revolution and the french revolution uh, are, are surprised that the, actually the haitian revolution pushes the ideas emerging out of the french revolution pushes them even further uh and, and, and insists um, that uh, that black people have to be included in this definition of uh, man and the rights of man. Um, in terms of broader impact, I mean the broader impact is 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 enormous. Um, so first of all, a lot of the Latin American revolutions um, are uh, draw on inspiration from um, from Haiti. So Bolivar, uh, in particular, um, spends time in Haiti. Um, but we also have there's there's been a lot of uh, more recent uh, or research research since James. Um, to show, uh, to show that people, enslaved people in the rest of the Americas were very aware uh, of what had happened in Haiti. Um, we see a bit of an increase in enslaved uh, rebellions, and in particular in size of of, of rebellions. Um, one of the things I see in a lot of the documents uh, I'm looking at, and I actually work on the post-emancipation period, so. Um, my research starts in, in the 1840s uh, and continues on into 1907. Uh, even in the 1860s, there is uh, talk about, about Haiti um, as both potentially uh, inspiration, um, but also there are, there are a lot of fears from British uh, colonial officials that uh, peasant rebellions in Jamaica might uh, suddenly become a new, a new Haiti. Um, so I think for white slave owners in the Americas, um, Haiti made clear that actually um, the foundation of slavery was not as stable as they thought it, it might be. So the idea, again, this idea of um, the intellectual capacity of, um, of enslaved people and their ability to strategize, um, a lot of the slavery system, systems were resting on the uh, false belief that enslaved people were not uh, strategically capable of organizing a large-scale rebellion. Um, and the Haitian Revolution eliminates these ideas uh, in, entirely. Um, so the, the impact was, was tremendous um, throughout, and, and uh, hemisphere-wide throughout the Americas, and then also uh, in Europe uh, as well. Um, in chapter two, James comments that the slave trade and slavery were the economic basis of the French Revolution. And he quotes uh, Jaurès, a French historian, saying that the sad irony of human history is that the fortunes created at Bordeaux um, by the slave trade gave 
uh, rise to the pride of the bourgeoisie, which needed liberty and contributed to human emancipation. Um, so how does James explore the links between the rise of capitalism in Europe and Europe's prosperity and the slave trade? Mm -hmm. So again, I think this is an area that is um, that is not that James's contributions haven't been discussed quite as much. So um, certainly in the British context, we tend to associate these arguments about uh, capitalism and slavery with Eric Williams, uh, another Trinidadian, um, and I believe at one point student of uh, of C. L. R. James, um, who wrote uh, who uh, wrote a an Oxford uh, thesis um, and then. Uh, published the book uh, Capitalism and Slavery in, in 1944. Um, and I think Williams's work has been rightly celebrated uh, for its, uh, or has been rightly celebrated by some, I should say, uh, for its, its arguments around the extent to which, in particular, um, the Industrial Revolution may have been um, uh, the, 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 um, the capital that uh, that was necessary for the Industrial Revolution may have come from uh, from slavery. There have been s significant debates about that, and we don't really need to go into them. Um, but James is actually making these arguments for the for France much sooner or uh, uh, earlier than um, than Williams. And actually, as far as I can tell, they have not been taken up as much uh, by 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 historians. So the general argument is um, that. Slavery in the French uh, in the French islands, uh, which at this point include, um, or in, in parts of the 18th century, include Saint Lucia, uh, Guadeloupe, Martinique, and then uh, and then Saint Domingue. Uh, and we've been talking about Haiti, but the French colony uh, prior to 1804 was known as Saint Domingue. Um, that uh, that the profits uh, out uh, cr created by the slavery system and the plantation economy uh, in these islands. Uh, most of that money uh, and capital went back to France and then funded the the uh, extravagant lifestyles of uh, some of the wealthy and then of course this uh, the the bourgeoisie um, who then are in a position um, some of whom uh, to to push for uh, to to push for these ideas of of, of liberty uh, and then of course they then find themselves in quite a significant bind as the uh, slave rebellion that becomes the Haitian Revolution uh, is is uh, is going on in 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 Haiti. They're in quite a significant bind about whether they support this uh, support this or not. Their lofty ideas of uh, human rights and the rights of man should suggest that they should, uh, but their wallets do not uh, suggest uh, suggest that they should. Um, so, and, and I should point out that. Um, at the time of the Haitian Revolution, Saint-Domingue was the most lucrative uh, and valuable uh, colony in the world for any country. Um, so its value uh, to France was significant. Um, previously, that had been Jamaica had been the most um, had, had been the most lucrative uh, colony, but uh, Jamaica had been superseded by uh, by Saint Domingue in the uh, second half of the 18th century. So the loss of the the loss of Saint Domingue is significant, um, very very significant to uh, to France, uh, both symbolically uh, but also economically. Great. Um, before we discuss Tucson and some of the edits that James made to later versions of the book. Um, I, I wondered if we could chat a bit about the um, inner and outer contradictions that really reached a melting point um, during this revolution. So James says that economic prosperity is no guarantee of social stability that rests on the constantly shifting equilibrium between the classes with every stride in production, the colony was marching to its doom. So I wondered if you could speak a bit on those contradictions. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, uh, Sendemang was the most, uh, most valuable uh, uh, colony in the world for any, for any country at that point in the late 18th century. But that wealth, uh, was built entirely on the uh, on the ex on the extreme exploitation uh, of enslaved people. Um, so uh, James 
in in some of the early chapters, James describes uh, some of the um, some of the tortures um, that were um, that were meted out to enslaved people. Um, but in general, slavery in the Caribbean was incredibly uh, was incredibly harsh, uh, was incredibly violent. Um, some of that had to do with the crop in question, so that um, sugar is. Uh, incredibly labor intensive. Um, it requires uh, basically year-round labor, um, and from the from the point that a sugar that sugar cane is harvested, so from the from the point that the stalk is cut, there are about 24 hours in which it has to be processed, or else it is or else it spoils. So during harvest season, um, this was also uh, basically 24-hour labor um, in incredibly difficult conditions both on the plantation itself, but also um, in the sort of factory um, manufacturing section of plantations where uh, sugar was itself processed. So again, because of that very short time or short window of, of uh, processing a stalk of sugar cane before it spoils, um, these processing plants as they were, were actually for the most part on plantations, or uh, perhaps if there were two or three plantations, they might have a, they might share a uh, processing plant, but they were generally very close by. So that means that the work of crushing sugarcane uh, and also then boiling, um, boiling the juice that comes out of that and then making sugar, and this is again very hot work, um, of course, boiled sugar uh, is incredibly dangerous. Um, so even just the cultivation and processing of sugar was in itself incredibly dangerous and harsh work. Uh, and then slavery systems uh, throughout the Americas, uh, but especially I think in, in places like uh, the Caribbean, uh, the US uh, South, Brazil, um, all required um, sort of extreme punishments or the sort of a system of extreme punishments and oftentimes exemplary punishments uh, in order to try to keep large numbers of enslaved people uh, afraid. Uh, or this was, this was at the very least the idea. Um, so there's ex often extreme cruelty being meted out to, uh, to enslaved people who were seen as, as um, either troublemakers or perhaps uh, accused of, uh, of uh, organizing conspiracies um, or plots. Um, and what often happened is that, is that not everybody would be punished, but a few people would be in order to sort of show, um, show the rest of, say, a plantation, uh, what might happen um, if somebody falls out of line. So I think part of this idea of, of this system sort of moving to its doom is, is, is a few things. Um, one, the extreme wealth uh, that is being generated off of this level of cruelty. Um, two, particularly in a place uh, in a place like um, like San Domingue, but you also see this uh, in Jamaica, um, you have um, colonial uh, white colonial elites who are feeling incredibly threatened about their position vis-a-vis -vis the political elites in the metropole, so in France. Um, so part of how the the um, Haitian Revolution even begins is that, is it, it starts um, sort of very early on as um, some sort of political unrest uh, or at least political unease um, and agitation uh, among uh, colonial whites in, in uh, Saint-Domingue who see the French Revolution beginning and want to make sure that they are getting the, the access that they, uh, that they feel they deserve. And then that creates, that opens up a door in particular um, for the for, uh, very successful uh, slave rebellion. Um, so, so I think there are a number of ways, and you see this actually across a lot of the Caribbean, that these societies um, were, were, were not necessarily going to be able to sustain the, uh, the gross exploitation uh, at the same time as this wealth is just sort of vanishing uh, from, from, these, uh, from these colonies. I wondered if you could speak a bit about the sort of intermediary class that were the people of color and how they related to this whole situation. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, so uh, I often refer to them as free people of color in the, uh, in, in, and that's what I would refer to them as in, in the um, Jamaican context. In the French context, they were often referred to as Jean de Couleur. Um, and this was a group of people who um, were usually the descendants of uh, enslaved people at some point. 
um, but were generally, or not, not all, but were uh, a lot of them were um, mixed race people who had usually been born uh, free um, or had or had had their freedom either purchased, uh, uh, had their freedom purchased for them, um, who are in this kind of middle uh, layer uh, in Caribbean society. So um, they are particularly in places like Jamaica and uh, and Saint Domingue, um, there's a much larger proportion of them than say in the United in in the U.S. context or in what in the colonies that would become the United States. Uh, so there are many more of them. They they're actually forming a quite significant class um, in in Caribbean society, particularly in uh, in Saint Domingue and um, in Jamaica. In Saint Domingue, in particular, uh, many of these people are actually sort of moving between, particularly the, I should say, the elites in this group. Uh, are moving between France and Saint-Domingue. So some of them are being educated in Paris, they are moving through, um, they're moving through French society. Um, I should say some of them, uh, because their uh, African heritage might be quite distant, uh, some of them might be what we might refer to as white passing. Um, so they're, uh, they're moving through uh, French colonial society, uh, or some of them are moving through French colonial society. Uh, others of them are, of course, not uh, necessarily moving through uh, French uh, colonial society, but they might have a slightly elevated position uh, in Haitians or in, in, in the society of Saint-Domingue by virtue of not being enslaved. Um, there were some, uh, there were some, not all were mixed race, there were some uh, free pe uh, people of color who were, uh, who we might refer to as free blacks. Um, but though they tended, not, this is not exclusive, but they, or this is not, um, entirely the case, but they tended to be um, on the poorer spectrum uh, of that group. But the key thing there is that they are, is that they're free. And so part of what this means is that actually, um, whereas modern readers might anticipate that there is going to naturally be an alliance there between enslaved people and free people of color, um, there really wasn't uh, a, a, was not an alliance uh, there. And again, I'm speaking very generally here. Um, but there wasn't an alliance there. Um, and in fact, there are different, part of what makes the Haitian Revolution so complex. Um, and if you read James's narrative, it is actually, it, it is incredibly well written and it's incredibly engrossing, but it is quite complex, uh, a, a narrative. Um, not because of any lack of skill on his part, but because the event itself required, was that, was that complex. Um, and so there are definitely, I mean, there are different um, leaders of the Jean du Color who are engaging in different projects at different times in the, uh, uh, during the 13 years of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, and it is part of, um, it's part of Louverture's, I think, uh, uh, strategic genius that he actually is able to defeat some of these leaders towards the end, and so then basically takes full control over the island of Hispaniola. So that would include both San Domingue as well as what we now think of as a, uh, or we, what we now call the Dominican Republic. Um, so these, so these conflicts remain, but then by the time we get to uh, 1803 and 1804, um, it is largely a um, I would say for the most part, uh, the free people of color are now allied or were then allied with, uh, with Louboutin and eventually Dessalines. Yeah, so Hugh asks, how much did James consciously try to make Toussaint a great man of history? And is there a story of mixed leadership? Um, in the book, a lot of the narrative seems to pivot around figures like Louverture and Dessalines. Um, James included a lot of edits in later versions, um, but I wondered what you think the role was of these men in the revolution and how James might have changed his approach um, in later versions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, you know, and again, there are, I, I'm not a, a historian of the Haitian Revolution, so I'm probably the wrong person to speak to about um, this question of mixed leadership, although I'm actually very interested in, in, in that question. Um, there, there is some work in particular about um, some of the gender language that emerges in, say, the Haitian Constitution. Um, so there, there's some people, I believe it was Elizabeth Caldwell, who did some work, uh, who did some work in that, in that arena. Um, but yeah, I think the narrative does present um, Louverture first as the sort of grand mastermind who uh, who basically um, 
leads a group of mostly nameless, but not entirely, uh, but mostly nameless uh, forces. Um, there is then in the narrative, and here I'm speaking about the 1963 narrative, um, there's then a, a, a part in the, in the discussion where um, there's a significant conflict between uh, Dessaline, or not Dessaline, uh, between uh, Louboutin and this, uh, and, and another key figure uh, who is basically kind of an adopted nephew, adopted son, Moise. Um, and Moise, uh, Louboutin treats Moise as, as um, almost the uh, voice of the, ins of the, the enslaved rebels, so the people who are starting to question uh, Louboutin's leadership. And the conflict here um, is, uh, I think there are, there are two main conflicts that James points to. Uh, first, the conflict over whether, over the extent to which Louboutin seems to be appeasing France to some degree. So uh, James presents the conflict between Moïse and, uh, and Louboutin uh, as uh, Moïse representing larger concerns about the extent to which um, planters are still kind of being mollified in uh, in in Louboutin's um, in, in the colony that Louboutin is overseeing, uh, and then also uh, a a conflict about about the plantation sector or the plantation economy. Louboutin believed very strongly that the way to maintain or that the way to keep slavery away from, from Saint-Domingue, but to keep um, Saint-Domingue a French colony, was to revive the plantation, uh, the plantation sector, um, which he does with a range of you know, fairly, harsh, um, uh, har fairly harsh policies. Um, I mean, I'll say that this prefigures a lot of eman post-emancipation uh, uh, concerns and conflicts in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, and throughout the Americas um, in the 19th century of basically what these colonies should be um, if slavery is no longer uh, is no longer present. So in that sense, Louboutin uh, was certainly not alone, um, although again I think this might come as something of a surprise to readers who are encountering the book for, for the first time. So Moise uh, is, is then executed um, and this, this again seems to, um, uh, James seems to treat this as, uh, as Louboutin's fatal flaw. And I think that is where you start to see this kind of great man narrative where you're, you're thinking about um, one leader's uh, trajectory, uh, fatal flaw, uh, and then, and then his, his demise. Um, and then, and then Dessaline comes in towards the end of the narrative as the person who is actually able to see, uh, who's actually able to see the, um, the re uh, revolution, the revolution through. Um, so Cynthia asks, James also positioned the book, uh, see for example his lecture in Montreal in 1968, later in his life in relation to the Cuban Revolution. Um, in your view, how might we think about this book in relation to that project? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is, I mean, this is one of the really interesting things about the difference between the first edition, which I'll admit I have not read, and then the second edition is that the first edition written in 1938, there is no Cuban Revolution anywhere on the on on the horizon, um, whereas the second edition has is is written after uh, the the Cuban Revolution, um, and there is a final um, uh, coda to that um, book, or I believe it's uh, phrased as an appendix, um, that is actually called from Toussaint Louverture to uh, Fidel Fidel Castro. Um, and interestingly, he actually does not take up much of, of the question of the Cuban Revolution in this, in this appendix. So it's titled from, from Toussaint Louverture to Fidel Castro, but it has surprisingly little uh, information about, or he, he kind of, I think, in a lot of ways holds off on passing judgment on, on the Cuban Revolution. What I think is very interesting, though, is he describes... Um, Cuba, he describes um, Martinique uh, and other parts of the Caribbean as West Indian, which I think is a very interesting move um, because West Indian tends to be, it's actually a term I, don't, I, I tend not to use in my own, in my own work, um, unless it's of course in the source material, um, but it is a term that tends to refer to the Anglophone Caribbean, the former, uh, the former British colonies of the British Caribbean, it's what West Indian tends to refer to, and he is using it basically instead of the word Caribbean. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting things that one could do about whether that is the right call to make or whether uh, or, or how we think about that. But I, but I think part of what he's doing there is insisting that the language uh, differences or the language divides in the region um, and also the different imperial trajectories in the region. So the Caribbean is a region of several uh, of several different several languages and also several uh, European empires and eventually U.S. Uh, imperial endeavors. Um, and he's trying to suggest that those divides are less important than a sort of West Indian or Caribbean mindset and approach. And in that context, he sees Louvatour uh, and uh, and Castro as, as sort of similar uh, similar figures, along with say M. A. Césaire, uh, who mentions Danny Cipriani uh, in Trinidad uh, as as well. Um, so he's making a very intent uh, in in he, he's making um, a very um, pointed move, I think, to speak about the region as a whole region um, and one that perhaps can then inspire, I think his, his pivot is, is, is very much towards uh, the independence movements in Africa. Um, but so he's thinking about perhaps a West Indian, uh, a West Indian orientation towards um, some, of these, uh, some of these independence movements that are emerging in Africa at the time. That appendix um, includes his commentary on M.A. Césaire's uh, poem. I wondered if you could speak on on that discussion a bit. Uh, that I cannot do. Actually, it's been it's been a while uh, since I have since I've read that section. Um, I will say though, I mean, I think part of of what is happening in in or what he's describing um, in this section, he points to uh, to Negritude, which of course is coming out of uh, Césaire and other. Uh, and other French Caribbean thinkers, uh, and also Garveyism, so coming out, uh, so Marcus Garvey uh, coming out of, uh, of Jamaica. Um, and of course, in the 1930s and into the 1940s and 1950s, uh, James was very much embedded in Pan-African movements, um, some of which were uh, really headquartered in London, which where, where he spent a fair amount of time. Um, and so I think you, you with what comes out of this is, again, a real uh, investment in not allowing the linguistic divides uh, within the Caribbean to, to sort of um, uh, to sort of disentangle or uh, water down the intellectual fervor coming out of the region. Um, he also talks about Jose Marti, uh, Fernando Ortiz. Um, so I think that is one of his uh, one of the really important things that he's doing. And then he's also again trying to think uh, in 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 the most Pan African way possible. I don't remember whether he actually uses the term uh, Pan Africanism in that in that appendix, but it is very much running through the way he is thinking. He's talking about these thinkers, and again, his constant sort of pivoting to or thinking about uh, Africa from the vantage point of, uh, as he would say, the West Indies book definitely doesn't read like an academic history, but it's a riveting narrative that interweaves philosophy and political analysis and really captures the political intrigue um, of a revolution. I wondered if you could comment on what you think makes his writing so powerful. Hmm. I mean, I think so uh, James was also uh, was also a journalist. Um, he had, uh, if people have not read uh, Beyond the Boundary, I would strongly uh, strongly recommend it. Um, so I think part of this is that he's coming. He he's he came to this work as a writer first. So um, he's just he's just a great writer, uh, which is which is uh, first uh, first of it. Um, second, I think you know he was not necessarily beholden to academic forms because he wasn't uh, he wasn't a um, a historian working in the history department, so he had a, or he seems to have felt a freedom of um, construction of the narrative that perhaps other academics uh, might not have, might not have felt as free to experiment with the form. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I tell people when they read, when they read the work, and particularly the final chapter, because um, the final chapter is both, I think, in a lot of ways, the most engrossing, but also the most narratively dense. Um, there's, there is a lot that's happening there. Um, and I actually tell people to read it for the first time, to read it quite quickly, um, and not to get uh, too bogged down in what is happening precisely when, but to sort of get swept up in, in the spirit of, of, of what's going on. Uh, and I think James really allows you, the, the way that he writes, the, there's, a, there's a propulsion to the narrative, um, even in that chapter, which is 
quite a long final chapter, um, but it sort of propels you along in this uh, in this in this way. Um, and so I, I think so I think that's part of it. I think you can also just tell that he is incredibly invested. Um, about, he's incredibly invested in telling this tale. He feels that the Haitian Revolution is important. Uh, he feels that it is it is important for people to know about. Um, I mean, I think. At this particular moment in 2020, I am still teaching um, teaching students who have never heard or who have heard about the Haitian Revolution, maybe, uh, but don't know why it's so important. Um, and I find myself in this moment of kind of you know this is such a signal event um, in in history. In fact, I say to my students, and I know people will, will question this, but I do say to my students that it's the most important event in world history, just so they can get a sense of how important they think it is. Uh, but I think you get that sense uh, from him as well. This isn't a dry uh, exercise for him. Um, that it is that that it's incredibly meaningful. Uh, it's incredibly important, and he feels that we should find it as important. Uh, and I feel like if in 2020 we're still having to have this discussion about the Haitian Revolution's importance, uh, we can only imagine how in the 1930s uh, and at that point um, Haiti had just emerged from a in, in 1934. From a nearly uh, nearly twenty year um, uh, occupation uh, of U.S. forces that, had, that uh, U.S. Marines had occupied um, Haiti from 1915 to 1934. So by the time he's writing this first edition, Haiti is emerging out of that occupation. Uh, you can only imagine just how necessary this kind of work would have been, and I think that also comes across in uh, in the writing. Uh, and I see a comment here. It was uh, Rachel Douglas's The Making of uh, the Black Jacobins, which was the text I was uh, mentioning uh, earlier. Uh, so I want to make sure that I, uh, that I, shout, uh, that I shout out that text. Great, thank you. Um, Christian asks um, if you have a sense about how widely the book is still read in the Caribbean today um, or how available it is as a text. You know, I don't know, actually. Um, I imagine it is probably being quite widely read in the universities, um, but I can't say necessarily how available it is um, or how widely read. Um, I will say that the um, that the second edition, which I think is the one that we're all working with, and the the Left Book Club's edition is also the second edition, is much more widely available um, and actually quite cheaply available. Um, than, than the first. Uh, but I can't speak to that, and I certainly, that, that, that's an important question I would actually love to, to, to know more. Um, I do get the sense that it is more commonly read, um, at least in U.S. universities, than it is in British universities, so there's still, I think, a long way for it to go uh, in terms of it sort of being the go-to, uh, the go-to text, uh, at least. Great, thank you, Christina. And final question. Um, what lessons do you think we can draw from this book for class struggle and anti-colonial movements and international solidarity today? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, I think certainly, um, again, fr from what we've been discussing about James's emphasis on, uh, on Pan-Africanism, um, I think certainly, um, at least w among the African diaspora, I think James would be calling for um, uh, sensitive, but nonetheless uh, a Pan-Africanist uh, uh, approach. One that isn't necessarily, that isn't, of course, uh, flattening uh, differences among the diaspora, but where we're sort of focusing on uh, on sort of common uh, uh, common goals, or at least a common cause. Uh, and then I think that that would then ex extend to the idea of liberation, uh, at the very least. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that, that I think about in relation to the Caribbean um, is how, first of all, most of the Caribbean is not flag independent. Um, so there's a, um, an anthropologist named Yari Marbania who, who writes about this in a book called Non-Sovereign Futures. Um, how, so most of, the, most of the Caribbean is actually still um, in some kind of colonial relationship to either a European power or the United States. Um, and then those countries that are flag, technically flag independent, um, with the exception of Cuba, are enmeshed in all kinds of, um, of uh, in particular, debt arrangements with and debt obligations with the World Bank uh, and the International Monetary Fund and other organizations as well. Um, so I think there's still really important questions to be thinking about in terms of, of, of liberation uh, and uh, thinking in more sort of a global south way as opposed to uh, simply thinking about the struggles of one group 
uh, or pitting pitting the struggles of one group against the next. I think um, I think James is James's use of the Haitian Revolution to think about the struggles happening in other regions really prompts us towards uh, that kind of work. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we're out of time just now. Um, Christina, thank you thank for you. speaking to us today. This conversation has really enriched at least my understanding and appreciation of this timeless work. Um, thank you also to everyone else for joining the discussion. Yes, thank you all. And for your questions and contributions. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I hope this has convinced you to do so um, because it is a really inspiring work.